So today we're going to talk about RNA analysis, part one. In this lecture, we're going to talk about approaches and principles. We're going to zoom in on RNA expression analysis use cases. And then we're going to talk about limitations and pitfalls. First, some background. With RNA expression analysis, our real goal is understanding the transcriptome, which could be loosely defined as all of the expressed RNAs in a cell. The transcriptome varies by cell type, tissue and organ, environment and by treatment, time of day and age. Traditionally, DNA arrays have been used to understand the transcriptome. RNA expression um, is older than DNA arrays, but really took off with DNA arrays in the late 90s and early 2000s. And the big advantage DNA arrays had were they were physically addressable and spatially defined. Um, most of these DNAs could be cDNAs or short or long oligonucleotides. Um, DNA arrays are also used for things that are other than RNA expression analysis. For example, chromatin immunoprecipitation on chip or chip on chip to understand where transcription factors are binding on promoters. They've been used for resequencing or genotyping, for example, to find SNPs in genomic sequence. They've been used extensively for DNA copy number analysis. And to find, and as a generic readout technology. The basic principles of DNA arrays involve uh, Watson and Crick hybridization or base pairing. For example, the northern or the southern blot. But instead of um, the probes being fixed on a membrane, now they're fixed on a, a, a solid surface, for example, a glass slide. Here you can see. We have fixed probes here that are aligned on this particular solid matrix, and then a labeled target. And when the labeled target hybridizes to its cognate probe, for example, down here, um, you can actually read that signal off and, and get an understanding of what the intensity and expression level of that target RNA is. The technology is, in fact, descended from the northern blot. So to remind you, in a northern blot, you have samples here and you run them on a gel. And then you probe with a radioactively labeled DNA or RNA probe. And for example, in these two conditions, we have relatively low levels of a particular RNA in this sample and higher levels of a particular RNA in this sample. Um, so many RNAs are separated. In, this, in each lane, there's many, many thousands upon thousands of different RNAs. But you're usually only detecting one or a few species. Um, typically, you would probe each northern blot with one or a few probes. The readout is typically on an X-ray film or um, a related imaging technology. And in addition to getting the uh, intensity of the RNA expression, for example, uh, lane 2 is brighter than lane 1, you also get the size of the RNA. You can think about DNA arrays as reverse northerns that are done in parallel. So in this case, you start with total RNA, convert the total RNA to cDNA, and then amplify the antisense RNA and hybridize to an array matrix where each well here would have a different cDNA um, uh, already uh, physically bound. So the cDNAs are spotted on a solid membrane or glass slide. One or two samples are labeled and hybridized to this array. They can be read out, read out with an array scanner. And what you do not get is size, but what you do get is the intensities of hundreds or even thousands of different, um, of different RNA species. So our first question, DNA arrays test the mRNA size and expression of several hundred genes in a single sample. The answer to this is false. They test the expression, but don't give the size of the messages. A bit about sample preparation. So in DNA arrays, the real, the real enabling technology for RNA expression was linear amplification. And in this case, um, you could add a, a, a DT probe with a bacterial polymerase T7 tag at the end. Um, and then using the T7 RNA polymerase, you could amplify the cDNA many thousands of fold and end up with amplified antisense RNA and finally, you would hybridize this RNA to cDNA DNA arrays. And this paper is actually published in PNAS in, in 1990. 
However, T7 polymerase isn't perfect. The average human mRNA is about 2 kilobases. T7 has a long way to go to reach the 5' prime end of the average message. And so the amplified RNA or the ARNA gets shorter with each round of amplification. Question 2. What's the effect of labeling bias? Um, is it A, loss of signal from the probe sets designed against the 5' prime end of the long transcripts? B, enhanced detection of probe sets designed to the 3' prime end of transcripts? C, both, or D, neither? And the answer is C, both. You both get loss of signal from probe sets designed against the 5' prime end, and, and because of this, you also get enhanced detection of probe sets designed to the 3' prime end of transcripts. There are several different types of uh, DNA arrays. The first and maybe the most popular type uh, is used to be the cDNA array as sort of uh, developed by Ron Davis and Pat Brown. The advantages to the cDNA array are that they're sensitive, um, open source, and relatively low cost to produce. Disadvantages are because the cDNAs use chunks of, of uh, the cDNA, there is a higher possibility of including a region that could cross hybridize to another gene. And there's also production issues involved in, in producing these cDNA arrays. You have to amplify um, either bacterial clones or PCR products, normalize them so you have the, roughly the same amount per each spot, and then deposit them. Another technology is the long oligonucleotide arrays. So these are, these are produced uh, synthetically. The advantage of this type is that they're sensitive, they can be commercially sourced, and they're high density. And disadvantages are that they're also, because they are typically longer than the very short oligonucleotide arrays, there's also a, a chance of cross-hybridization. The density isn't quite as dense as the very short photolithography-based arrays, and the cost is higher than cDNA arrays. Finally, there's pr probably the most popular type, which is the small oligonucleotide array, for example, as, as produced by Affymetrix. Um, the advantage here is that they're extremely high density. There are multiple independent measures for each um, transcript's expression. There's a litany of open source analysis algorithms um, available to analyze these arrays, and um, you also have base level discriminants. The disadvantage of using these commercial arrays is A, obviously cost, because um, they're more expensive to produce than, uh, than typical cDNA arrays, and also sensitivity, because the probes are small, they're not as sensitive as, uh, as some of the long oligonucleotide array or cDNA arrays. Here's an example of a high-density oligonucleotide array. It's an Affymetrix array. Um, these are physically addressable high-density arrays with uh, current technology more than 2 million probes per array. So here's a blown-up figure of this is approximately 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter. And what you can see is um, extremely small spots enabled by photolithography where we have deposited both perfect match and mismatch oligonucleotides. Um, well, you have 2 million probes, and, and they can be distributed randomly throughout the chip. And this affords a lot of redundancy, because there's, obviously there's not 2 million genes. There's only about 25,000 or so protein encoding human genes. So this allows you to measure each transcript multiple times. Um, you can also include transcripts uh, randomly throughout the array that can allow for background subtraction. Um, it also allows you to toss out outliers and... Um, and it enables really sophisticated array normalization schemes. Question three. High density arrays afford A, resistance to outliers, for example, a small scratch on a portion of the array, B, built-in normalization controls, for example, gap DH, C, base level discrimination, D, all of the above, or E, A and B. And the answer here is A and B. Um, because uh, while, while it is true that, that uh, base level discrimination it, it is possible using these high density arrays, it's not a product of the redundancy. It's really a product of the s size of the array. Next, we're going to move on to image analysis from pixels to probe intensities. So after scanning these high density arrays, each array is basically an image file that are several hundred megabytes in size. Um, each probe um, that's deposited on the array takes up approximately 100 pixels.
And from these pixels, a single measurement of the expression of that probe is determined. And the expression values for all the probes are, are on the array are condensed to something called a cell file. Next, you want to take the cell file and go from probe to transcript intensity. And to do this, each transcript is represented by somewhere between 20 and 30, 25 more perfect match probes called a probe set. Um, sometimes mismatched probes are also included. Um, these are designed to reduce a specific cross-hybridization -hy events. And you can arrive at expression of the transcript by subtracting the perfect match from the mismatch sig signals. And there is significant debate about the usefulness of these mismatch arrays. Um, for each transcript, ex expression is a product of the probe set intensities, and this step is called condensation. And there are many condensation algorithms available, for example, MASS5 or Plier, which are products of AFI metrics, but also open source algorithms like RMA, uh, GCRMA, and DCHIP. And many of these, if not all of the above methods, have been implemented in the R project um, with the, the bioconductor uh, with the bioconductor group. So you can download these the bioconductor uh, code and there are implementations of many if not all of these algorithms within it already done for you. Let's switch gears and go on to talk about use cases. So maybe one of the most common use cases is looking at the difference between two samples. So this starts with a biological question. For example, what are the difference between normal and healthy tissues in, in humans? What's the difference between a wild type and knockout mouse or fly or yeast? What are the differences between a control and drug treated sample? An example of such a, a experiment would be from 30 separate age, gender, and ethnic group matched patients, we get tumor and healthy tissue biopsies. We take 60 arrays um, and normalize them. You could use a t-test to define differences at an individual gene level, correct for false discovery rates to account for multiple testing, and the end product could be a graph or a table of the differential gene expression. These data would then typically be validated by an RT-PCR assay, an independent measure of the gene expression, and ideally with an independent set of tissues or tumors. There are sources of error in these experiments, um, as there are in, in almost any experimental method. Um, some of these sources of error are biological. For example, patients could have significant genetic differences. Um, Tumors can be very different from one another, depending on the type of tumor and whether or not it's been uh, identified properly. Uh, animal models can be uh, very different from one another. There could be uh, genetic strain differences in the background, etc. There are many environmental issues that could impact the experiment. For example, the diet, the time of day, um, the season of seasonal, uh, seasonal animals could impact the gene expression levels that are observed in these types of experiments. You also can have issues like classification. I mentioned earlier that pathologists can stage tissues. And what one pathologist may call a stage 3A, another pathologist may call a different stage. There can also be technical differences in sample preparation or batch-to-batch -batch variation in arrays, even ozone levels that vary from day to day. Um, and that's actually a published paper from, um, from uh, the Rosetta Group, um, which used to be a part of Merck. Uh, there are also many differences in how people analyze these data. So condensation algorithms can influence the end result. Statistical methods and cutoffs can have a major impact on, uh, on what the end, end, end result of a particular experiment can be. The solution to most of these problems is biological and technical replication. So here's another common use case, the A versus B versus C versus dot, dot, dot to N. For example, tissue-specific gene expression. And one of the exp experiments that we did in my group about 10 years ago was looking at tissue-specific gene expression in the mouse and human and rat genomes. And the basic reason we did this was that knowing where a gene is expressed can shed light on its, um, its physiological function. So we constructed a gene expression analysis at Atlas with, uh, with an array designed against human transcripts from RefSeq, Unizine, ensemble and a proprietary uh, company's uh, gene models called Solera. And mouse transcripts were, were uh, assembled from RefSeq, Unigene Ensemble, Solera, and the Rikin project in Japan. So in total, we looked at about 35,000 putative protein encoding genes from both species. And we looked at their expression in 80-plus human tissues and 60-plus 
mouse tissues. And because we're sort of, uh, we're, we're, we were sort of uh, shackled by what sort of human samples we could get a, a hold of, um, we, we basically were able to, to test what we could test. But with the mouse experiments, we did all the dissections ourselves. And because, uh, because of all, many of the issues I mentioned on our previous slide, we controlled for age, gender, diet, and time of day in our dissections. And where possible, duplicate or more dissections, duplicate or more labelings, and duplicate or more hybridizations were performed. So here's sort of a global view of the data where on this axis you have uh, different tissues of the mouse, and on this axis you have different genes expressed. So here you can see here's a chunk of genes that are expressed at a high level where red means higher and green means lower in, uh, for example, brain tissues. Here's another chunk where you have a, a, a very tight cluster of genes that are expressed specifically in liver and gallbladder. And here's a chunk where you have genes that are expressed in bone and bone marrows. But you can see that there's chunks of genes and they tend to be tissue specific. To identify these genes, we used ANOVA to define values that varied by tissues and FDR statistics to, to account for multiple testing. We used Mike Eisen's cluster and tree view programs to cluster and visualize expression values. We found that about 70% of the genome was expressed somewhere in, um, in, in the 60 or, or so tissues, and 90% of, of, of genes um, were found to vary according to, uh, according to tissue types. So the vast majority of genes have some element of tissue specificity to their expression. We also wanted to validate this type of data. So to do this, we, we performed about 2,000 PCR reactions. We're able to confirm 82% of the expression uh, observations by amplifying the entire open reading frame. Um, we also performed uh, northerns and C2 hybridization um, to, to validate uh, a lower number of expression profiles. And finally, as a very large-scale experiment, um, we uh, were able to compare our results on the Affymetrix array with results from uh, Tim Hughes and his colleagues um, at the University of Toronto um, in 31 tissues and 12,000 genes in common with uh, their, their, ma their mouse atlas. Um, and we were able to, exp to confirm about 75% of expressed genes matched across the two separate platforms. So there's also pit pitfalls and limitations to the A versus B versus N design, including all of the pitfalls in the A, ver a versus B design that I mentioned earlier. Uh, for example, human tissue donors are harvested at different times of the day after different time periods from different people who ate different things. They're also harvested by different people. Um, and even in the mouse, uh, in controlled circumstances, certain tissues are troublesome to get high-quality RNA from. For example, the pancreas, which expresses many different RNAs. Question four. An atlas of 10 tissues from three outbred animals was done. Which of the following sources of error definitively ap apply? Is it A, genetics, B, time of day, C, dissection errors, D, A and C, or E, all of the above? And the answer is A. Um, and pay attention to the word definitively. So time of day may apply to how um, this atlas study was done, but you'd need more info to know about that. And dissection errors could also apply, but you'd need to know more information. Uh, A definitively applies. So outbred animals are genetically distinct, and you could very well have, um, have uh, a source of error introduced by that. The final use case is time series expression analysis. So the, the impetus for this design is that many important processes occur over time. For example, during development, uh, during a tumor's growth, uh, during aging, uh, over time of day, etc. And these designs can be accommodated, as in the previous section, um, analyzed using ANOVA or a two-way ANOVA. Um, some, of, some, some of these processes are, in fact, periodic. For example, the cell cycle, the circadian clock, the somite clock, etc. And these processes require different experimental designs and analytic methods. So here's a case of, uh, of looking at um, circadian rhythms in transcription. So typically, if we're doing a, a type of study like this, we would take a genetically identical mouse, like a C57 black 6J mouse strain, keep the animals in 12-12 light dark conditions. So here on this graph, you can see 
the light bars indicate 12 hours of light and the dark dark bar indicates 12 hours of darkness. <coughs> and after two weeks of this, we would put the animals in constant conditions and allow them to drift. And you can see they're going to start to drift their locomotor activity here. Um, and while in LD conditions, they have a very precise onset of activity, <coughs> during dark conditions, they start to get up a little bit earlier every day. And so the, their clock is running at 23.6, not exactly 24 hours. Um, and typically, we would collect tissue from three to five independent mice per time period. And we would look at expression every two hours for two full days, prepare the RNA, and label it and, and hybridize it to high-density oligonucleotide arrays, and then use a variety of statistical methods to identify uh, periodic rather than simply a changing gene expression. And so one of the issues is that your temporal resolution uh, really impacts your statistical pow power to detect genes. So here, if you just concentrate on the upper left-hand panel, we have uh, a set of gold standard genes that have been replicated in multiple studies. And we're looking over a two-day time period at various sampling resolutions from one to two to three, et cetera, uh, hours over this two-day period. And what you can see is that at two-hour time resolution, we capture about 70% or so of the, the gold standard set of circadian genes with about uh, a 20% or so false positive rate. Once we slip to even three-hour time resolution, we're now we're now down around the 30% uh, true positive rate and uh, about a 25% false positive rate. And at four-hour time resolution, which is un unfortunately the historical experimental design that many groups, including ours, have used, we had a relatively low 20% uh, detection rate of the gold standard set and a, a relatively high 20% uh, or so uh, false positive rate. So. After doing the experiment and oversampling, we were able to do leave some out studies and determine the optimal uh, time sampling from a cost benefit perspective. And that's every two hours over two days for, um, for, for uh, optimal detection of circadian rhythmicity. When we did this, um, we were able to fit all this data um, to a, a wide window of periods between six and 48 hours. And what we were able to find was, as expected, there's a huge chunk of, uh, of genes that dis display uh, an approximately 24-hour uh, signature of, uh, of circadian gene expression. We found about 10 times more genes were oscillating than we had previously found. Uh, to our surprise, we also found genes oscillating at the 12-hour time frequency and at the 8-hour time frequency, many fewer genes than at the 24-hour frequency, but still uh, they existed, and this was extremely interesting. Here's an example of uh, RT-PCR data validating the expression of genes from the 24-hour time frequency, the 12-hour time frequency, and the 8-hour time frequency. So what are the pitfalls and limitations of these sort of time series studies? Well, all the previous pitfalls uh, also apply here, but also temporal resolution defines your statistical power to define periodic gene expression. And there are other parameters that you might be interested in in studying periodic processes like the cell cycle. For example, the phase of the expression, when an event is occurring. Uh, is occurring. Um, knowing something that occurs in G1 versus G2 has biological meaning, whereas um, just knowing it's periodic is less valuable. Um, and informatic methods obviously have a big impact on your ability to detect rhythms. So question number five. Many early cell cycle and circadian studies were temporarily undersampled, including ones from my lab. This produced A, false positives, B, false negatives, C, neither, or D, both. And of course, the answer is both. It produced false positives, noisy transcripts were called cycling, even though they weren't, and false negatives. Low amplitude or out of phase cycling transcripts were missed in the previous studies. I'm going to leave off with a thought question. Design an expression experiment to measure periodic transcription in the cell cycle of an organism with a doubling time of 90 minutes. There's many correct answers to this, but you should be thinking about the following issues. Genetic background and numbers of organisms, sampling resolution, uh, measuring over multiple cycles,
uh, trying out various analysis algorithms, um, thinking about your validation strategy, and of course, maybe most important, what are you going to do with the data once you're done? So the limitations of RNA expression analysis by DNA arrays are uh, generally a lack of sensitivity in any given tissue. About 50% of protein encoding genes aren't detected from any one experiment. Relatively low throughput um, nature of DNA arrays. They're somewhat expensive, um, on the order of three to five hundred dollars per sample. And hybridization signal is a really an indirect measure of mRNA abundance. So in the next lecture, we're going to start talking about using RNA seq to uh, to alleviate these these uh, limitations.